Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you and good evening, and thank you so much for having me as part of my maiden voyage to Colorado Springs. You know, those of us who grew up in the 1950s and 60s, as I did, take the nonprofit scene for granted today, quite frankly. And it's genuinely a phenomenon of our lifetimes. The result of national philanthropic efforts like the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the NEA, of course, but also of numerous corporations, visionary individuals, and far-reaching and catalytic foundations like the one we're honoring here tonight. You know, from fewer than three dozen nonprofit professional theaters in America in 1961, the theater movement now numbers more than 2,500 professional nonprofit theaters in our country. Not only in Chicago and New York and Colorado Springs, but in Blue Lake, California, and Douglas, Alaska, and Whitesburg, Kentucky, all homes to important theaters today. In fact, our whole movement, if you take museums and operas and literary organizations and more, numbers now 105,000 organizations employing more than 5 million arts workers nationwide. And we can truly say we are a critical part of our national economy. That said, probably all of us have been challenged in different contexts to defend why we're important. And I think I'm preaching with the choir when I say we've all probably gotten up and cited those economic impact studies together. <laughs> we all know them. There was a great one that landed on my desk this week from the Philadelphia Cultural Alliance, which I would point out to you as a model, which said in Philadelphia, for example, the Philadelphia arts community now impacts the local economy $3 billion every year, that the average person spends $30 per person per event above and beyond the ticket price on surrounding local businesses like restaurants and parking and souvenir shops and more, and that the local art scene supports 44,000 full-time jobs, 80% of which are outside the arts industry. Jobs like accountants, marketers, construction workers, bartenders, hotel managers, the printers who print our programs, the piano tuners who tune the instruments, the people at the fabric stores where we buy the fabrics for the costumes and more. We've all said for years, if the arts are in danger, the entire small business local community is going to feel the aftershocks. And especially in the current world, the NEA's current motto, Art Works, is timely and aptly profound. Now at the same time, if you're like me, that sole economic impact can seem mercenary. And I've already met some of you, probably, who can recite better than I am, the, I am able to do, the impact we have on young people and students. I remember Shirley Bryce Heath at Stanford University a decade ago, a researcher, not an arts researcher, but a general researcher, who was charged with looking at all forms of after-school programs, scouts, athletics, arts groups, yes, and she came back and said, I got to tell you, it's the art students who outpace every other group in virtually every dimension. It was the arts kids who were four times more likely to run for class office. It was the arts kids who were eight times more likely to participate in math and science fairs. It was the arts kids who showed dramatic reductions in disciplinary infractions. The arts kids who scored more than 160 points higher on their verbal and math scores and SATs. It was the arts kids who were exponentially more likely to graduate from high school than their non-arts peers. A Harvard study looking at kids who study Shakespeare said that kids who study theater have greater verbal acuity, greater complexity of thinking, greater tolerance of ambiguity, greater self-discipline, and greater self-esteem. And especially now, on the heels of what, whatever side of the aisle we sat on, I think we can all agree was a vitriolic campaign season. We have to recognize the role of the arts in building civic dialogue and social cohesion. You know, I remember a study when I was in the theater field from UCLA that said that a kid who has been in a play is 42% less likely to tolerate racist behavior than a kid who has never been in a play. And was, was I the only one who noticed that in the Columbine aftermath in that coverage, time and again those kids said the only place on this campus where we could come together, the only place where the cliques lost power, the only place we found community was the Performing Arts Center. 
For these reasons and more, for decades, we have been able to stand up in front of any audience and say, if you care about your local community and your economy, you must care about the arts. If you care about the educational achievement of your children, you must care about the arts. If you care about a democratic, diverse, embracing, pluralistic society, you must care about the arts. All of that said, it would be disingenuous for me to suggest that the arts today are in a healthy moment. For as we all know that the environment in which we function is an enormously challenging one. It's a time of diminishing resources, a time of dwindling audiences, a time of unstable organizations. Foundation giving at many foundations is down if it still exists at all. Government arts budgets, depending on where you live, are down. And corporate arts programs have entered a kind of open freefall. But while our tendency in the arts is to focus on the economy as the source of our wealth, what I want to suggest to you is that the real challenges we face in the community moving forward are not financial at all. You know, to explain, in 2006, in meetings all across the country, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, where I worked, convened more than 700 artists, managers, and technicians to discuss what the most vibrant challenges were they faced. Two years before the economy fell, we heard about alarming patterns of audience erosion in every field. Declines in subscription sales, decline in single ticket sales, uncertainty in the face of demographic change about our previously presumed allegiance to traditional Eurocentric art forms. Two years before the economy fell, we heard that audiences were overscheduled and exhausted. We heard that 42% of men and 55% of women said, I am too tired to do the things I want to do. And the number one answer to a poll about what do you look forward to on an unscheduled evening was not going to the symphony or going to a film or the theater or even dinner with friends. The number one answer was, I'm going to get a good night's sleep. Not surprisingly, after decades of growth, our audiences are eroding. And our fixed costs, driven in many cases by lumber and facility insurance and health benefits and more, in tandem with declining revenues from giving, means escalating ticket prices that threaten to place the arts outside of the reach of so many in our communities we want to reach and serve. Two years before the economy fell, we heard about the triply disorienting impact of technology. Technology is competition, Technology is shaper of customer expectation. Technology is changer of economics. Now, as I'm sure you know, by the time she graduates from college, a typical senior will have spent 20,000 hours online and an additional 10,000 hours playing video games. Leisure time internet consumption has risen 50% in the last three years alone. And we now operate in a cultural context where, where video games outsell music and movie recordings combined and are now reviewed in the arts and culture section of the New York Times. Thanks to the internet, you know, we think we can shop any time of day, getting anything we want. We can shop at 10 in the morning, 3 in the afternoon. We get jeans made to our own bodies. They arrive on our front doorsteps. Expectations of personalization, customization, and convenience that the live arts which have set curtains, set venues, attendant inconvenience of travel, parking, and the like, simply can't meet. And what's it going to mean in the future when we say that symphony, opera, or ballet ticket is $50, $75, $100, when our audience is used to downloading culture on demand 24-7 for 99 cents a song or for free? These are huge questions, but we are not alone. We are in a fundamental redefinition of culture and communications in this country. A redefinition that is shaking the newspaper industry, shaking the book industry, shaking higher education with the emergence of online universities, and in a taste of what may be yet to come, has left tower records and music distribution in large disarray. Surely we recognize ourselves in the words of the poet Adrian Rich, when she says, we are out in a country that has no language, no laws, whatever we do is pure invention, the maps they gave us are out of date by years. And aren't you glad you invited me here to brighten your day? <laughs>
You know, as an occasional student of history, I was really struck at a conference in New York several years ago when in a Q&A somebody raised their hand and said, you know, what would it mean if we thought that the moment we're in is the equivalent of the religious reformation of the 14th century? Could it be that we are in the midst or the beginning of the arts reformation? I thought, boy, that's a great question. You know, because if you know anything about history, you know that the Reformation was made possible in part by technological reinvention. The invention of the printing press meant suddenly anybody could have a Bible. Something you nailed on a door in Germany could be distributed nationwide in a matter of days and flood the continent. And God knows we are in a technological revolution and a massive redistribution of knowledge. The religious reformation decimated and upturned the old business models. As national art strategy leader Russell Willis Taylor has said more than once, the reformation was a great time to be a land buyer and a rotten time to be a monastery. <laughs> and on some level now we're seeing struggling orchestras nationwide asking themselves, are we the monastic equivalents of the present day? But I think most powerfully, the religious reformation at its very heart asked the question about the necessity of intermediation in a spiritual experience. Why do I need a priest to intercede for me with God? A question that's now finding a direct parallel by the similar question in the creative industries. Why do I need a professional artist to have a creative experience? We are seeing a massive recalibration of the cultural landscape as we move from one defined by observation and consumption to one defined by participation. Because even as arts attendance is eroding in this country, arts participation, people writing their own poetry, singing their own music, making their own films, is exploding at an exponential rate. We're seeing the emergence of pro-ams, avocational citizens doing work at a professional level. You see their films on YouTube and film festivals, dance competitions and more at one end. And what we call hybrid artists, professional artists who work with non-professionals, not by economic necessity, but because they believe the work they are called to do cannot be done in the traditional orchestra hall, museum, or theater. Wherever we look, we are seeing a recalibration of the cultural scene in a massive, unforeseen way, which on the one hand is offering us fantastic new opportunities in aesthetic expression and cultural collaboration, but on the other is threatening the ability of traditional institutions to set the cultural agenda. Now, if you think on the one hand I'm calling for the end of the institutions, let me be clear. You know, the religious reformation did not mean the end of the Catholic Church, a church that continues to be deeply meaningful to millions worldwide as it provides deep emotional and spiritual meaning to its adherents. And yes, whatever we do, we must continue to nurture, promote, and build the great institutions for the future. They offer artists our best chance of lives of economic dignity and the logical place artists who work at a certain scale must work. But we should also acknowledge that these institutions are less likely to be, or more likely to be, less numerous in the future and less likely to command the lion's share of the philanthropic resources. And so what does this mean going forward? You know, I think it means that in the new age, the arts are facing a time of seismic choice. A time of choice in which we have to expand our vision and perhaps see everything I've described not as an either or, but as a both and. For me, emblematic of this new behavior is the great Trey McIntyre project, a modern ballet company that is only six years old. Trey McIntyre is a choreographer who's created large scale work for Houston Ballet, San Francisco Ballet, Boston Ballet. And six years ago when he said, you know, I want to start my own full-time company, each of those city people said, come here, if you come here, we'll write the checks, we'll make it happen for you. And instead he chose deliberately to start his company in Boise, Idaho, a town of less than 200,000 people, five, mi five hours by car from a major urban center, a town with no particular interest in modern dance and no local funding community. You know, once landed, he began to get the local attention, not through billboards and flyers and mailers, but through what he called spurbans, spontaneous urban events. Meaning if you were at lunch in Boise downtown at noon, 
suddenly dancers would appear from seven different directions, go for three minutes and then disappear into the day, leaving the audience going, what the hell was that? He launched his first performance, not in a theater, but at a drive-in movie theater where the audience was encouraged to tailgate. And before the dancers took the stage, they showed a documentary film, a film that wasn't about Trey, was not about modern dance, was not about ballet. It was a film in which every member of the company came forward and said, this is what I love about Boise. A reversal of investment that had the audience in the palm of their hands before they danced the first step. And when she said, when your mother said, it's about the city more than it's the symphony, I thought, that's the song. They've united the entire local community thinking holistically, inviting sculptors and painters to create new works around the theme of the upcoming season, which become auctioned at the annual arts gala, giving visibility to those artists and the company and the artists splitting the gate. They've aligned themselves, not with an arts agenda, but with a civic agenda. Boise will be the world center for innovation, an agenda that has led them to lead to the creation of a $300,000 annual prize, which may or may not go to an arts organization, but recognizes innovation, and which is led by a steering committee comprised of the president of Idaho State University, the mayor, the head of the Chamber of Commerce, the sheriff, and John Michael Shirt. Trey McIntyre's lead dancer and managing director. They have worked with the Basque community, a migrant community, to create new dances. They teach arts education in new ways. And in my favorite entrepreneurial gesture, they have created an arrangement with the local high-end bar. If you go to Boise, there's a place you can get a martini made with basil-infused vodka and muddled cucumber. You know, it's that place where they have come up with a different signature drink, each one named for a different member of the dance company, overcoming the anonymity with which dance company members frequently toil. If you go to visit, they will try to get you to drink your way through the entire company. You can't do it. <laughs> I have tried. But in a particular arrangement, half of the proceeds for every drink sold go back to Trey and Company. They are generous, they are fearless, they are entrepreneurial, and six years after they arrived in Boise without a penny in their pockets, they are one of the 10 largest modern dance companies in America, and when they arrived at the airport to begin their world, world tour, they arrived to find that the city had erected a banner over the entrance saying, good luck, Trey McIntyre Project, Boise's cultural ambassadors to the world. Yeah. You know, in this way and more, as an artist, he works diligently and specifically and creatively at the highest level. He is a world-class choreographer, bringing craft and expression to its highest form. But where he works, with whom he works, why he works, under what circumstance he works, and what the value of the work is in itself are all being radically rethought to carry the arts to a new age. You know, whether you make the decision to preserve the great institutions of the past or move forward in new ways, the road you will tread, I think, will be a hard one. It will require leadership and concrete planning and executional skills and patience. It will require us, I think, to place the audience at the center of what we do. And this is heresy from the field I grew up. The nonprofit arts movement was not invented for artists. It was invented for artists, yes, and the art form, yes, and audiences, yes. And we do ourselves a profound disservice anytime we focus on one of those to the detriment of the other two. There is an enormous difference between a mission of to produce the great plays and to connect audiences to great plays, or to between to produce plays for children and to bring joy to children's lives. Second missions that will change every decision about where money is spent, how staffing is arranged, everything going forward. It will provoke anxiety, as indeed all change does, especially among existing artists and existing audiences for whom what we have done has, has given the most profound meaning of their lives. It will require us to seek less stability than adaptive resilience and to begin to ask ourselves new questions about how we share information, how we reach decisions, and how we manage conflict within our organizations. And I think it will begin 
frankly, by our asking ourselves the real question about not what are we going to do next. What is it we're going to stop doing to give ourselves the time and the energy and the resources to tackle the great questions that will guide us in the future? You know, clearly, this is a challenge and easy for me to say. But I would urge you as you think about this to recognize that however important the arts have been, the arts will be even more important to our world as we move forward. Think about the explosion of creative industries, the iPod, the iPad, computer games, and more, none of which many of us thought about a decade ago. And if Daniel Goldman in his book, Working with Intelligence, is correct, he says the primary indicators of leading in any industry are empathy, the ability to listen and motivate, commitment, integrity, the ability to communicate and influence, the ability to initiate and accept change, the things we embody and teach every time we take a stage or we stand before a student. The arts will be even more important in education and cognitive circles. You know, with no disrespect, the traditional emphasis on science and math alone, while critical, falls short of integrated left-right brain thinking that the future demands. A role for the arts that I first heard articulated by Mike Huckabee, who said that making a math and science only education curriculum without the arts was like creating a database without creating the server. And the arts will be the arts will be increasingly critical as we embrace the future of a democratic pluralistic society. As Francois Matarazzo has observed, the arts enable people with non-majority lives, values, and beliefs to represent themselves to the majority rather than to be the subjects of their own characterizations rather than the objects of the characterizations of others. Think of how our understanding of the criminal system has been expanded by the exonerated, a play made by death row inmates, or by, of Iraqi war refugees, by aftermath currently touring the country, or by women through the vagina monologues, or the role of the film Philadelphia and Normal Heart in humanizing the HIV positive and gay community for an indifferent nation. Ever since Charles Dickens' novels changed child labor laws and Uncle Tom's Cabin galvanized the abolition movement, the arts are fundamental to social progress and change. It cannot be accidental that when we want to come together, we sing the Star Spangled Banner, or when we protest, we sing We Shall Overcome, because making art together makes community, community poised for social progress and for change. Steve Coleman, the psychologist has written that intractable solutions, intractable problems like the Middle East, the abortion rights debate, racial animosity, and more share three things in common. A competitive win-lose dynamic, a reinforcing feedback mechanism that tends to reinforce pre-existing ideas and filter out dissension, and an oversimplification of issues. The arts offer us the antidote to the intractable. In the face of competition, we invite cooperation. In the face of simplification, complexity of nuance. In the face of self-reinforcement, we offer community. Remembering that I don't care what field we fund, whatever we do, we invite people to come together with people not like themselves, to look at our fellow human being, not with hostility and fear and suspicion, but with generosity and curiosity. God knows if we have ever needed that capacity in human history, we need it now. You know, I'd like to close with a story I actually heard from Fred Adams, who some of you may know, the long-term artistic director of Utah Shakespeare Festival, who told me about his two years of mission work in Scandinavia. You know, as a Mormon, Fred spent the obligatory two years ministering to others the story of the Latter-day Saints. And he was assigned to rural Norway, where the combination of language barrier, darkness, and cold made the experience dispiriting at times, to say the least. In a country where the sun can set often before 3 p.m., there were many days where he would knock on the door, which he'd be followed by an unfailingly polite invitation to step inside, blank looks at the stories of the Mormon, and then Norwegian folk songs sung at length, accompanied by odd alcohol and mysteriously prepared fish. 
you know, one such night could be sort of exhausting enough, but months of them began to take its toll, and especially one night was particularly hard. The, the snow was particularly deep, and as Fred struggled to make his way back to where he was living, he found himself angry and depressed. He said he had never been colder or wetter or more tired, never had life seemed more futile or dispiriting, and his quest seemed more bleak. But suddenly his companion, because we know you mission in two, his companion grabbed his arm suddenly and said, look up. And there, when he looked up, in all of its splendor was the aurora borealis, shimmering in the night, exploding in color, reminding him of deeper, more profound mysteries of which we are but a glimmer. And that, said Fred to me, is what we do in the arts. We tell people to look up. Yes, the times in which we live are historically hard. Yes, we can despair. Yes, we can yield to our anger in these times. But we have a choice. We have a choice. And we can work as we must and as we do to change lives, one kid at a time, one audience at a time, one community at a time. In a world where we are drowning in information and starved for wisdom, in which we crave inspiration and community, in which we struggle to rise above the torpor of the day-to-day -day and search for empathy and inspiration, I salute you as you say to your children, your audiences, your community through the arts, look up, look up, God, please look up. I salute you and the vision of B for supporting arts and culture in the great community of Colorado Springs. I promise you the hand of the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation is extended to you both now and for years to come. And I thank you for your kindness and your patience in listening to me this evening. Thank you and Godspeed.